middle of the 1990s. I was walking in the Kremlin garden with Boris Yeltsin. And I said to Boris, tell me in one word, what is the state of Russia? He said, good. <laughs> I was surprised it was falling to pieces. I said, tell me in two words. He said, not good. <laughs> no one. No one, I think, could say not good about this summit, this conference, this building, or this great city of Tokyo. And it's a very great delight to be here this evening. Now, I've been uh, coming to Japan for many years, and I warmly congratulate the ULI on selecting Tokyo as its venue for this summit. By any yardstick, Tokyo is one of the great cities of the world. And earlier today, some of you perhaps may have been present, we uh, had a roundtable discussion sponsored by AECOM as to whether events like the Olympics due to be held in Tokyo before too long can be a catalyst for the development of healthy cities. And there were many interesting ideas aired, albeit briefly, but aired nonetheless, around that uh, central proposition in that brief discussion we had this afternoon. Covered many things, the value of sporting facilities for leisure and health, the importance of transport and hotel facilities and tourism, the implications of high-rise buildings for the future of the city, the likelihood of continuing density increases as population grows, the need for the Olympics to leave behind it a permanent legacy that will benefit the city of Tokyo, and much else besides. And I think over the uh, days of this uh, summit, all those themes will be further developed. And I believe everyone will leave the summit better informed than they came uh, yesterday or today. Now, Japan has been one of the world's economic giants for many decades. Today, she has a nominal GDP of around 5 trillion US dollars. Twice, to put this in context, twice the size of the UK economy. She contributes 8% of global GDP, with one-fifth of that coming from this great city alone. She exports vigorously and invests widely. It is a country and an economy that no one can sensibly ignore. Japan is also a firm ally of democracy and of the West. Now, I think these virtues are not perhaps the only reasons why it's appropriate to have the ULI summit here in Tokyo. Japan not only remains a favored country for real estate investment, but will be a host of the Rugby World Cup in 2019, and Japanese rugby, I've seen a lot of it in the sevens, in Hong Kong, in Glasgow, in Twickenham, they are getting surprisingly good, damaging good. <laughs> I hope they realize when they come to Twickenham next that it is polite to come second. <laughs> and of course, Japan also, Tokyo also looks forward to hosting the Olympics and the Paralympic Games. I watched the Olympics and the Paralympic Games in London. And I must say, for those of you who haven't seen at length the Paralympic Games, they are remarkable. Please don't go there thinking you're going to watch people who are injured in a sort of expression that perhaps it's somewhere I ought to go. It is thrilling competition. And the great stadium in London was absolutely as packed for the Paralympic Games as it was for the Olympic Games themselves. And I hope and believe that Tokyo will do those Paralympic athletes the same courtesy of filling that stadium and cheering them home, just as they were cheered home in London. Now, these things, the Rugby World Cup and the Olympics and Paralympic Games, they're mega events, none perhaps in the world larger than the Olympics, with ramifications stretching from construction to security, all of which will be relevant to the discussions of this summit. And I think the fact that uh, the summit is under the auspices of uh, ULI is highly appropriate. The ULI has influenced policy and practice of real estate and urban development since its inception way back in the 1930s. 
It has built a remarkable reputation, and we are delighted to be here under its umbrella this evening. And Pat, thank you very much indeed. Now, around the world, in every corner of the almost, urbanization is accelerating as populations grow. But land remains a finite asset. Well, not entirely finite, as we see in the Spratlys, but by and large, <laughs> but by and large, it is a finite asset. And the advice, the research, and the skills of you and I become ever more relevant if we're to use that available land wisely. Our world has changed. It has changed, and it continues to change in a truly remarkable way. Economic power is more balanced as the economies of the East outpace those of the West. The science of medicine is lengthening our lives. Climate change and resource scarcity is demanding innovation. Technology is changing how we live, while the shift from rural to urban life changes where we live. Today, one in every two people live in cities in 15 years' time, two in every three people are anticipated to do so. And each of those trends are accelerating. Events move faster today than any time in our history, and make it harder for us to keep up with what has happened and plan what we wish to happen in the future. And of course, of all human endeavors, Planning, construction, and development cannot ignore such comprehensive change. It has to adapt. It has to adapt to take account of these new circumstances. Because the quality and design of yesterday will not be acceptable or successful in the world of tomorrow. And it is, I believe, quite impossible to overstate the importance of the built environment. It is crucial to our whole way of life. And organizations that retain the ambition to consistently adapt and innovate and improve will offer the greatest satisfaction and I think commercially will enjoy the greatest success. And those that cannot or will not innovate are likely to fall by the wayside. Now, if you accept, broadly accept, that hypothesis, there are some very important questions that arise. How can cities like Tokyo seize the opportunity of hosting the Olympics to create a lasting legacy for future generations? More widely, how can we make cities more dynamic, more attractive for people to spend their lives in and to live? What is the role of mixed-use developments? How can we best use limited land space in the middle of cities? And can we blend industrial and commercial activity to create city jobs and yet still attract, retain an attractive lifestyle for the people who live in and around those areas? What innovations are going to be necessary to cope with growing energy cost and demand and the increasingly specialist needs of a rapidly elderly, elderly populate, rising elderly population in so many parts of the world. As the scientists keep us alive longer, we face new problems we had never faced before. Not just the finance ministers wondering how they're going to cope with the cost of it, but the planners and the urban developers have to decide how we are going to house and care and provide the facilities for people of increasing years and perhaps with limited facilities. Now the questions to be answered are many and various and increasingly difficult to address. Projects are becoming more complex, more integrated, and often multidisciplinary. More and more often the market is demanding comprehensive performance, a fully integrated service from feasibility to design to construction and in some cases as well long-term finance and maintenance. In short, a one-stop shop for development. Now tomorrow, at the summit, 
These will be among the topics that will be considered in depth. And I hope and believe that everyone will benefit from those discussions. Because to a greater extent, I think, than anywhere else, the construction industry, in all its aspects, in its widest aspect, is affected by the economic climate more than anyone else. And since the financial crash of 2007, there have been some very difficult times for them to move. The best of the industry has overcome those challenges and now operates in a more clement environment. But to be successful, it still needs to be ambitious. Ambitious not just for profit, but ambitious to make our cities more attractive, more serviceable, and more resilient places in which our fellow citizens can live. And I would like to add, if I may, in these brief remarks, a slightly more personal note. As a boy in the 1950s, I lived with my family in London, in Brixton, a poor part of London, in relatively poor circumstances. There were five of us living in two rooms. Of course, there were millions of others who were far worse off than us. There still are, in every city of the world. But I have never forgotten the difficulties that my family faced. And I remember, as a boy, walking away from the grisly immediate streets in which I lived to districts not very far away, and looking with envy at homes that were warm, and welcoming, and buildings that had charm and style. I have not a shred of doubt that there are millions of people in every city of the world who do exactly the same thing today. And the development industry, in its widest aspect, in which I include planners, designers, builders, environmentalists, and everyone else concerned, the development industry can provide the built facilities that make cities more attractive places in which to live. And when you do so, if you do so, you will change lives. Not just for an hour or a day, but for a lifetime. And that surely must be the highest ambition, morally, socially, and economic. And to do that, to do that to best effect, you need to draw on the most original minds and the foremost skills. And you will find many of those here this evening and attending the conference over the next couple of days. So in conclusion, let me simply say this. As a consumer of your expertise, I wish you all both a stimulating summit and every possible success in the work that will follow from it. Thank you very much.